on. Hi everybody. This is Tara. Oh, this nice. is Michael. And they are with Visia and your last name is Galena. That's right. Right. Yes. Okay. Yep. Cool. So I'll give you my quick spiel. So basically, <laughs> in case you've never used a microphone before, these ones they want to be right by your mouth, basically, okay. and you just want to kind of talk right into them. So if, if you need to move, you can just, like, take up with you and try not to, like, just drift away because then I won't be able to hear you anymore. Okay. <laughs> uh, and that's pretty much it. You don't need to talk any differently than you normally would, just conversational tone, and it'll sound like a conversation. Because okay. so. cool. that's what it is. That's what it is. And we'll do three, nine, ten-minute sections. And okay. I'll just kind of wrap each one up, and don't worry if we go over. And we're just totally casual. This is like the casual. casual podcast, right? I didn't send you a bunch of things up front like, do this, do that, give me all these. It's just laid back. Thank you for being here. Yes, no, we're excited. It's always, always fun to chat. Nice little break from the day-to-day. -day. <laughs> the day-to-day. -day. Although, gosh, it seems like you guys have... Well, I will get there. Okay. But I don't want to make it all organic, which is probably a word you love. <laughs> All right, tell me when you're ready, Sam. All right, here we go. Hi, this is Mish Hancock, and you are listening to Mishmash, a place where I get to talk to the weird, wacky, wonderful people of this world, people I adore and want to know more about. Today, my guests are Tara and Michael Galena. They are the owners of Visia, a St. Louis restaurant that celebrates vegetable-forward cuisine, flipping our conceptions of what modern dining and eating tastes like. Welcome. Hi. Thank you guys for being here. Yes, it's a, it's a nice day to be here inside. It's freezing so, outside. Right? Oh, St. Louis cold. It's, a, it's Although it's warm cold. today compared to the Well, past we week, have I a guess, heat but. wave going on right now. <laughs> I mean, what is it, like 30-something? I, I mean, I it, it feels like a heat wave, though, because we're so used to going negative whatever you know, yeah, yeah I don't remember right signing this weekend too. I know. So. I don't remember signing up for these temperatures when I moved here, but <laughs> yeah. what are you gonna do? Uh, welcome to the Midwest. So, um, so I got to I got to eat at your restaurant one time, which was so amazing. And the the thing I think about, like if somebody said, "Why should I go eat at this?" Yeah, I would say because they think in, of food in a whole different way. Like it is so not what you will see anywhere else that I know of. So tell me how you guys got to this place where you're like, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> well, the whole story is starting from the very beginning. No, from the very beginning, <laughs> medium time. Um, uh, the very short, short version of the long story um, is that I met Michael. Um, five, how long? I don't know how long. About five years ago. About five years ago. Um, well, we were working at an amazing restaurant in um, in New York called Blue Hill at Stone Barns, which is. Um, arguably one of the best restaurants in the country, one of the top restaurants in the world, um, and really the epicenter of education as it relates to sustainable farming and how chefs and farmers can better work together to create a more sustainable cuisine. Um, Michael was the chef de cuisine there for many years under uh, Dan Barber, and I took the uh, chance of going to work there to do an apprenticeship working on the farm. and doing some service training and you know how it goes you see this cute guy in the kitchen and uh, one <laughs> thing leads to another and you're married no. <laughs> a lot happened in between but um but no that's where we met um and for me personally was a, a hugely educational opportunity as it relates to um, fine dining how to create magical experiences for people um, and to really tell the stories of the farmers as it relates to the food. Um, so it was a part, yeah, that job had a lot of interesting components. But uh, but that's where we met. And then mm -hmm. I'll, I'll let you explain how, how we got back to St. Louis. Yeah, I think, I mean, just coming back to St. Louis, you know, visiting the family and stuff like that, I think we just saw this kind of emerging, emerging city um, and this food destination, you know, and a lot of things happening and stuff like that. So it just kind of sparked our interest to, you know, this idea of, of you know, we had a great opportunity to learn so much at some of these other restaurants and to be able to bring it back home to somewhere that's, I guess, you know, more just starting off as a really incredible food city um, to create something special there. And and is it, it's purposeful where you your restaurant is located, mm -hmm. correct? Because you're right by the CIC. You're right in there where all the, you know, a lot of startups and the that whole new everything that's going on with St. Louis and bringing all this new technology into the area. Now we've got this awesome new food. I mean, it all comes together, right? Yeah. I mean, I think when we first moved here, um, we had absolutely no idea where we would go, where we would open, if we would even open anything. It was all very unknown. 
and we got introduced to the Cortex District sort of by accident. Um, neither of us had any idea what was going on down there. We just were invited to go to a meeting about something else, you know, in the neighborhood, and we're kind of like, what, what's going on here? This is, this is interesting, Sounds you know? And you just had that, you know, I had that feeling in the gut of, you know, my stomach that um, something big was happening here, and the more we learned about it, you know, all the stars aligned, there was a space, you know, it fit with what we were looking for, you know, it gave us the chance to build a restaurant from scratch, which, um, that's a whole other podcast for a whole other time, but, um, <laughs> you know, allowed us a real creative opportunity that we could not have found any place else. Um, and the fact that we're doing something that's a little bit, you know, non-traditional in a community with a lot of people that are, you know, in the same mindset, um, I think really allowed us to blossom early, um, which was great. And is, you, you say non-traditional, so is the kitchen non-traditional? Like, would I go to another restaurant and, and think, wow, it's so different at Visia? Or... No, I, th I think we just, you know, we try to push ourselves each day to, like, do something different and better. And I think, like, the whole Cortex area is, is about innovation and creativity. And, you know, that's kind of how we try to look at food with, you know, turning vegetables, you know, whereas, you know, the Midwest can be kind of a meat potatoes kind of area. Um, I feel like we try to do the opposite of that and really kind of create the vegetables to be more of a star of the plate and um you know thinking differently of you know how we can cook those you know with our wood fire oven and, and different things like that and um yeah yeah i mean non-traditional is probably not the right word but it's it's just it's different and um you know i think a lot of people that come to dine at the restaurant um they either come because they're really excited to try something different or they're really nervous about trying something different, um, you know? And so we always have this fun challenge of trying to figure out, you know, and read people and, and try to see where where their interests lie, how comfortable are they right. with, you know, how the format of our menu. Yeah. You? And you know, it's, we just yeah. try to get people to come in with, you know, come in with an open mind and, you know, let us cook for you. But for it's, the night. I mean, the food is beautiful, you uh, know? I mean, it is just yeah. beautiful. It is, I mean, it's very, like, artistic. And, and so I, I'm, I can't, I mean, how does this happen? Like, do you, do you wake up at 3 a.m. with awesome ideas yes. or? <laughs> I'll let you tell that story, yeah, but that no, is I mean, exactly yeah. what happened. I mean, I'm not a notebook next to the guy. I just like email myself. So I'll wake up. Yeah. I mean, I'll wake up at three. I am so glad there's, I email myself all the yeah. time. I email myself things I got to remember to do or ideas I have. Mm -hmm. That's hilarious. Okay, yeah, awesome. Yesterday I was like, you sent me an email that just says oysters. What does this mean? <laughs> like I, you know, and it was like at late at night, you know, and it's just, yeah, I often find that he's sent himself several emails while I'm sound asleep in, in bed. Which is sort of funny. <laughs> but I think that's for him. It's just these like, you know, brainstorm ideas like, okay, what if we did this and this and this, but also it's, it's what the farmers are sort of telling us you know, we need to be doing, um, you know, I think a lot of the philosophy of our restaurant is related to, you know, letting the farmers dictate what needs to go on the menu as opposed to us saying we want this and it has to be this size and it has to be, oh, that's you know, cool. and, and I think for a long time, you know, I think chefs and restaurants, you know, there's this, you want everything to be perfect, of course, and you want everything to look a certain way and you want it to be consistent, um, which is, you know, key but at the same time nature isn't a consistent thing you know no, things change chaotic. all the time it's so chaotic <laughs> you know and farmers um can have a really great couple of weeks where everything comes out just the way it's supposed to and it looks beautiful and it tastes amazing but then sometimes it doesn't happen that way and you know if you're trying to support that farmer you kind of can't say oh well i'm only going to take it if it's just like this right. you know because how how do they continue on and to be able to provide you with those perfect things if they can't support their business in the times when it's not i mean this time of year I think is a great example of, you know, they're, you know, storage crops. That's kind of all that we've got access to right now, except those farmers that have, um, you know, tunnels and, and greenhouses, but you have to be a little more open-minded in the winter and in the spring when it's pretty slim pickings right. um, to, to really support that local model. Um, it's, yeah. I mean, we want, we yeah. want the menu to be a celebration of what comes in from you know, the farmers each day and you know, how we do our ordering is it's not always what I want. It's what they need us to use. And, I think, you know, you know, thinking of like food waste in general, I mean, that's, you know, you go into a grocery store and you see a bruised, you know, something, you're not going to buy it. So right. there's so much of that that goes in the garbage. Whereas if a chef that, you know, has the ability to, to take anything and make it into something delicious and incredible, you know, I, I, more people should challenge themselves with that than instead of just saying like, I need to have this perfect, you know, carrot that's this long and this thick and whatever to do this dish with, you know, you could, you should like push yourself to, to, to do things that differently. Right. Know? Right. I love that. I love that you've got, so you're like vegetable forward, but also farmer 
forward. Oh, yeah, yeah, because yeah. you're letting Farmer them driven sort, of, sort of the buzzword. Yeah. But uh, but really, that's the that's the truth. And I think we moved here and, and spent a lot of time researching. You know, are there enough farms to support what we want to do? Because you know, we would have really hesitated to open something if we felt like we could only do it nine months out of the year. Right. Exactly. Um, so we spent yeah we spent that time getting to know these people, going out to their farms, getting them to trust us because that's a big part of it. And I think. Um, I even took that for granted when we moved here about how some of these farmers, you know, you can say, oh, I'm going to buy all this stuff from you, but there's no guarantee. Right. And they've been burned by other people in the past who have said that very same thing. So you right. have to earn their trust as much as we're sort of earning their trust. It, it goes both ways. Um, and I think we've now proven to those people that, you know, the partners that we work with that, you know, we're open-minded to, you know, whatever they've got. Well, we are going to take a quick break and we will be right back with Tara and Michael. I know it does. Yeah. I can talk. I still. Do so. you have a three a.m. idea that we should talk about? I don't know. Let me check my phone. <laughs> let's, I say, let's go back to the back to the source. Let me check my phone. <laughs> Not from last night, but maybe from last week. We just did a bunch of many. Well, that changes. is so funny because I do this all the time. I email myself all the, like, and you know, kids nowadays they don't use email, right? And I'm thinking. Y'all are missing out, man. <laughs> this is this is how I remind myself of things like that. I that I'll think, oh, I should do this, or oh, I got this great idea, and I'll email it. There's so many ways to communicate now. Um, we internally, I Michael will not use it. It's just he's an email guy. But we internally use um, Slack for our oh right right yeah. Tool. And right. I, I've actually found that to be really helpful and effective. And most of the staff that we work with is under thirty, or you know, so that works for them. So they're like. You know, right? They just, like I can get them to respond to a message on Slack ten times as fast as a phone call, or you know, oh yeah, you know, phone calls, which is like, no. <laughs> don't do phone calls. <laughs> so you have to learn, you know, adapt to your surroundings. So, are there some three AM ideas we should? Yeah, explore? I mean, one that we actually just put on the menu last week. Or... Don't say it. Okay, we're gonna go there. Okay. All right, let's go. Okay, here we And we are back with Tara and Michael Galena of Missia. Um, I think we're back. Are we back, Sam? Okay. We're back. <laughs> um, we are back. We were talking about 3 a.m. ideas, and in the break I asked Michael, like, well, are there some 3 a.m. ideas we should share? So what are some 3 a.m. ideas you've had lately? Well, I think the most recent one was kind of a, we did um, this big party for New Year's, and we did a baked potato bar, and I guess, you know, I was at home later on and whatever, and I also was kind of interested. I one guest took a carrot, and instead of the potato, and s smashed the carrot and made a loaded carrot. Oh. So, um, yeah, that was one idea uh, recently of just like I mean, I guess one of we try to end the tasting menu with a vegetable, and a, a vegetable it's like I guess a little bit different outside the box, but very vegetable forward, which um, to me is kind of. You know, very very simple. Like you know, if if a farmer's growing the carrot in good soil and whatever, you don't have to do a whole lot to it. So it's kind of just this carrot that is roasted, grilled, um, and then put on a plate with a little bit of pork sauce. So we just took kind of that same idea, but stuffed it with uh, cabbage and mushrooms and all these other different things, and then still put a little bit of pork sauce on it and and serve it with a bowl of polenta. So it's you know kind of you know in the middle of the table, you can grab this polenta and eat it with the carrot. Oh, cool. That's really good. And you guys even have, I mean, vegetables are part of dessert, mm -hmm. too. Yeah, yeah, sometimes. Yeah, Summer Wright, who's our um, pastry chef, um, has, has definitely tried to think as many ways as she can about incorporating vegetables into Yeah, ice cream. And yeah. Uh, parsnips. Yeah. I love it. I think it's, I mean, I just think it's so fun. It must, it feels so creative. I mean, I just can't even, you know, you because we go out to our regular chain restaurants, right, and it's just like, Here's a hamburger and fries. Mm -hmm. well, not to say there's anything wrong with hamburger hey, and fries. Once in a while. But we, we yeah, love a good I, I, fries. Yeah, I, I, I get there. Yeah, I'm Sunday. like, I have a hankering for a hamburger today. I must have one. But I love the idea of thinking, and because, I mean, there's so many different kinds of fruits and vegetables out mm -hmm. there, right? And and there's so many different ways that you can play with them, and there's colors. And I just, I think it's, it's just amazing what you guys have done. And I mean, and your restaurant is really becoming well known in the area. Am I wrong? Uh, no, I mean, we're really very fortunate um, that a lot of, you know, media has sort of latched on to what we're doing. And, um, you know, we had a kind of a little overwhelming, but we had a, a really great end of 2017 with a lot of awesome recognitions from um, both local publications, 
as well as some national ones. Um, and for us, I mean, I think as, as wonderful as that is, and you work really hard and it feels nice to have somebody say, you're doing a great job. Um, <laughs> you know, ultimately though, I think it's, it's nice that if anything, we can be a part of the conversation of getting people across the country to say, when I hear the word St. Louis, or I hear the name St. Louis, I, I think about a positive association with like, there's all these great restaurants and there's right. all these chefs that are doing awesome things because it's not just us by any means. Um, you know, and I think the more that we can help contribute um, to that conversation, I think we feel a responsibility in that. Um, I think that's part of the reason, you know, for Michael to come back after 15 years of, of being away from living here is, you know, take, like he said, take those skill sets, bring them to a new audience because um, not every cook gets the chance to go to the French Laundry and, and go to Sweden and all these amazing places that Michael went, um, you know, but he can share those things with people here and still try to give them that educational opportunity. So I think um, their recognition is awesome, um, but I think there's there's a responsibility that comes with that recognition for right. sure, and we definitely feel that. Um, and we want our guests to be happy ultimately at the end of the day, um, yeah, think, because their, their vote the, counts the most. Yeah, that's been, I think, you know, I think with all the great press, I think the fact that we've got some really incredible regulars and people that frequent the restaurant all the time and We've built, you know, I think a, a good base of people that really enjoy coming to eat. And I think that means more than any of the any of the awards or any anything like that. For sure. So where have you traveled? I mean, you, I did not realize you had traveled to all these different places. Where was it all because of food? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I um, <clears throat> I grew up here in St. Louis. Uh, went to culinary school in San Francisco and spent, I guess, about four years out there. And was very very fortunate to work with uh, Daniel Hum. Um, at a restaurant called Campton Place, and that's what actually took me to New York. I'd never even been to New York before I flew in to start work the next day. And, wow. Um, yeah. Good story. <laughs> just, yeah, I mean, somehow Matt's one on Craigslist to get an apartment <laughs> that I stayed lived in for a couple months, and, yeah, I, I mean, I'd never even been there until the plane touched down. So um, moved to New York, thought I was going to basically be there for a year. I had no interest in really wanting to be in New York for that long except for it was just a you know everybody told me in san francisco it's like you've got to have new york experience to 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 be something so ah, gotcha. um so i went hoping to just get that one year of new york experience and stayed for 11 years so um it was definitely not planned but an incredible experience and then uh, just really fortunate to where in between um you know working at blue hill new york and blue hill at stone barns uh, Dan helped kind of me go on this trip of traveling through Sweden and, and Spain and working in some of the best restaurants um, there for the course of like uh, two and a half, three months. Oh, cool. I yeah. love Spain. I lived there for a year. I love it there. Yeah, it was incredible. Good food. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Lots yeah. of garlic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. Lots of garlic, good seafood. It was, yeah, it was really, you know, really incredible experience. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Yeah. So do you cook at home or are you just too tired to cook when you Sometimes. get home? I always wonder about this. Like, uh, you know, are you like Sunday going, oh, no, we're not cooking I wish today. we did more than we do. <laughs> I think there's always the idea that we're going to and then you're like, uh, let's just go out. I mean, it's, I think we're, well, part of it is we have this really small apartment right now with like a very limited kitchen space. So it's like, we just like have so much going on when we cook that it's like, you feel a little limited by the, by the space constraints. But, um, but we, we do every once in a while. I, I cooked on new year's. I cook too, but, um, I, I don't get to do it as much as I like, but, um, you know, we, we like to treat ourselves to a nice dinner when, when we can, but, um, it's definitely not as, as frequently. Yeah, I think I think Saturdays before we leave the restaurant, usually we'll try to like put a little grocery kit uh, <laughs> together. For it's a nice thing about owning your own restaurant. You have a, a nice grocery store. You can oh, always yeah, have. that's so. true. That's true. So I had and I've talked about this on the podcast before. I had a really interesting experience one time where I went into the grocery store and there were no fruits and vegetables. They had missed one shipment, you know, one shipment. Oh, wow. And and I was like, wow, we're. I mean, they had some, but it was very sparse. Yeah. And I thought, that's, that we're one shipment away from, you know, not having the, the fresh food that yeah. we're yeah. so used to. We think there's just a plethora of it out there. You should mm -hmm. walk in the grocery store, there it is. Um, so, I mean, with that thought in mind, I mean, talking to the farmers out there, I mean, did they, I mean, did they have a sense of like, yeah, this could, you know, one, one, just one shipment away from nobody having fresh food. I mean, I think there are, uh, farmers always live with that fear of it's one frost away or, right. you know, one terrible tornado or whatever the storm is that could totally wipe out everything that they've worked so hard to grow, which I think, 
Um, you know, a lot of these farms will do these CSA programs, I think, as a, as a little bit of an insurance where you can, you know, get your, your customers to sort of upfront pay for what they're going to receive as a so way to... So what's a CSA program? Um, so CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture. Okay. Gotcha. Um, and a lot of times you can buy a share um, into one of these CSAs and then let's say it's 400 bucks and it's for eight weeks and every week you go to the, the market or wherever their pickup location is and you get a basket and it's just whatever they've got. You don't choose. Ah, they gotcha. choose for you, which is kind of more or less like what we do. Right. Um, and I think those are really... Um, wonderful for people to sort of th start thinking in this way that we're thinking of like, okay, I've just got to be creative with what's available as opposed to going to the grocery store and saying, well, I can have pineapples and I can have avocados and I can have all these things that are shipped from anywhere because right. anything is available, uh, you know, now, nowadays for the most part. Um, so I think farms are, are using those programs more and more as a way to help, you know, offset some of that cost that could happen sure. if you, you know, a, a pest takes out you know a whole bed of tomatoes or you know what what it you know what have you because we're you know trying to work with farmers who are working organically or at least you know in the same you know maybe not certified but you know essentially are organic and sustainable um so there's tons of risks involved all the time yeah mm -hmm. it's it's kind of scary i mean it, it's you just don't realize until something like that happens how how quickly mm -hmm. all of it could go away yeah and like, i think you know, you know there is I think some of that stigma, as Michael was kind of just mentioning, with like the bruised vegetables, like there are things that can be, maybe there's beetles that bit into the leaves or things like that, and they don't look great anymore, but they're still edible. They're still, you know? yeah, and, yeah, definitely edible parts. And there's there's got to be a, a change in mindset of, of everybody just wants everything to look perfect, you know, and I think that's, you know, a huge contributor to why we have so much food waste in this country and so many people who are starving, but there's all this food thrown in the garbage, right. you know, it's just... Um, that's frustrating. So I think, you know, when we do get some of these weird things, we almost try to call it out on the menu to kind of get people to be like, well, why are you calling it an ugly carrot? And I'm like, well, cause it is, but it still tastes great. <laughs> but it, it tastes yummy. It's just not the prettiest, and I've had, most perfect I've had some, yeah. some customers or guests of ours that have come back and been like, you know, I sought out the ugliest vegetables I could find at the grocery store, you know, because you really inspired me cool. to do that. And I'm just kind of like, that's, that's pretty cool. That is cool. I love it. <laughs> well, we're going to take another break and we will be right back with Tara and Michael. Now I get to ask you guys questions. It was, I got to say, it was really fun doing research. Oh, good. It was so fun. <laughs> I learned so much. Oh, I was boy. like, oh my gosh, this is so you fun. You didn't find our mug shots, right? No. <laughs> well, I did, but I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> or at least for me. I don't know. Maybe, maybe Michael's got one I've never seen. I don't. No, no. <laughs> Sam does magical things over there. <laughs> when will this um, air? Well, I'm going to say within the next couple of weeks. I'm not, I'm, I'm terrible at getting these done on time. I'm just terrible. I'm so, I've got like a million things going on. And all, it's my own fault. I mean, so, you know, it's like people are, you know, some are like, I'm always busy. Well, I'm always busy, but it's my own fault. Right. I mean, it's not yes, like, it's a self -induced you know, I, I, I like being busy. I enjoy having all kinds of different projects going at once. So then what will happen is I'll think, I'm going to get these podcasts on a schedule. And then I'll go, Oh, I gotta go do this. Oh shoot, this just came up. You know, it's yeah. like I, I'm terrible at leaving room for things that are gonna pop up without, you know, that I just have to handle. Right. Um, hence the emailing myself I, at three AM a lot yeah. because I go, Oh, I gotta remember to do this. So sure. are you ready for us? I am. All right. Okay, we are back with Tara and Michael Galina of Vistia, and I've got questions for you. I was sharing with you during the break that it was really fun doing research. So one of the questions I have, um, tell us about your favorite little-known vegetable. I, I myself learned about samphire, which okay. is a sea pickle. I'd never heard of it before. I um, learned about yard long, which oh, are... Okay, they are beans. They're called yard long. Oh, yeah. They're from oh, okay. Asia, okay. but they're not. They're only a half a yard. Okay, <laughs> they're, they're not called yard longs. A yard okay. long, and then <laughs> oka, which is a New Zealand root vegetable. I mean, I was like, my gosh, there's so many different vegetables I've never heard of. So, is there one that you've worked with that we haven't? That is little known. I would probably um, pick saltus. 
Ooh, oh. which is really fun. Should I take yours? <laughs> <laughs> so Celtus is, it looks, it, it's in the lettuce family. Um, okay. And it's something um, that you see a lot in Chinese cuisine. Um, but it's grown for its um, stock more so than the leaves, which when you think of lettuce, yeah. you typically obviously are kind of going in reverse. But it's got this incredible, like when you cut into the stock, it smells like a jar of Jif peanut butter. Really? It's wild. It doesn't taste like peanut butter, but the aroma of it raw is this like, I, I just, it's so nutty. It's bonkers. Um, but oh, you can eat cool. it raw. You have to sort of peel the stock and I, I can let Michael explain what he does when he cooks it. I just know that it's delicious. But <laughs> how do you Salt cook it? Juice. I, I usually just braise it or serve it raw, but. No, you don't serve it raw. You can. You, you can, can slice okay. it or, so or like not, not necessarily raw, but like. Like compressed, marinated, and marinated yeah, and yeah, like a bunch of acids. Uh, were yeah, it's, it's into almost it. like looks like a broccoli stem or something, mm -hmm. but um, it's crunchy, it's a little bit sweet, it's a little bit nutty. Uh, but yeah, he like puts it in one of those vacuum seal bags and then puts a bunch of wonderful things into it and sucks all the air out. And then it's like it almost like has that like sushi, looks like a piece of sushi. Yeah. sushi. Um, that's really fun. And we have gotten some locally, um, some of the farmers have grown saltus here. Um, you can use the leaves too, and it makes a lovely broth. Um, but it's just, yeah, you don't find that at the grocery store. That's for no, sure. No, I've sometimes never even at, heard at, of it. at like you know Asian supermarkets and things like that. Oh, cool. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time thinking of one, but I would. I mean, I would say I think not even. I almost I'm, go with like using the whole vegetables, which, which is which really interesting. People, which people don't always do, like the broccoli stem. You know, where you see a lot of these things in like different cuisines, but for some reason. Sometimes in American cuisine, we you just don't see it. You we know, yeah, we just like much, take what like we consider stems, the good part. Yeah, stems, the roots of different things. I'd also go as far as not like not even thinking about vegetables, but I think one thing that people don't think about enough is fish. Uh, yeah, the fish like everybody gravitates towards like the salmon's and the halibuts and the sea basses of of the world, but no one I think looks at under other underutilized fish. Um, yeah, enough, and you know. Too many people are doing salmon, which you can't get a lot of fresh salmon. Right. You know, it's, it's all farm raised or it's, you know, whatever. And but, there's definitely a difference between farm But there's farm some really incredible wild. fish that I wish people would open up a little bit more to, like, you know, hake and uh, butterfish and, and other, you know, just underutilized product that would help, you know, the ocean kind of refill itself. Sure. I haven't even heard of butterfish. Yeah, they're delicious. They're like little sardines, almost like sardines, but. Not uh, much more mild. Atlantic. Than, than I mean, Atlantic. we we yeah. worked with them a lot in New York, um, uh, so like on Long Island and, and areas. Yeah, like I that. mean, we were very fortunate to where there's a program, and it's becoming more and more all over the country. But it's uh, called Doc to Dish, where it's basically it's like what Tara was saying with CSAs and farms. Uh, it's a CSA for the ocean. It's like basically. They go to the docks and the fishermen go out and then whatever they catch is what then they send out. So oh, it's, cool. they're not necessarily going out to just fish for this one thing. It's whatever they catch, whether it's bluefish or butterfish or, you know, something else. That's that's what you get. So you have no idea what you're going to get besides you know you're going to get fresh fish right off the boat. Right. Which is pretty awesome. That was a really, really cool thing. Um, we don't do a ton of fish here at the restaurant just because of being landlocked and right. we want to have a... Uh, a really strong idea about who's catching the fish that we're getting it from. So we have one connection. It's mostly shellfish out of Maine um, that we still celebrate. But um, you know, we'd love to introduce more fish. You know, at some point if we found good sources. I love it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, so my next question for you um, is okay. So I I was looking over all these food trends that happen every year. There's food trends, mm -hmm. right? Is there a food trend you're thinking? Let's just stop that. <laughs> Um, I mean, I'm thinking of like the unicorn food trend. Oh, been, like rainbow you know, like colored kind things. Of, and... It's been kind of crazy. Yeah, I um, think overindulgence of a lot of like so many. Everybody like associates, I think, like good cuisine with like foie gras and caviar and truffles and all that. And I think like getting a, a little bit more way of that, and then really celebrating like local ingredients. Like, yeah, obviously, if you're in in Italy or whatever and you've got these incredible white truffles that are in season and stuff like that that's that's awesome you know but you know going out of our way to think that you know good cuisine has to have all these like overindulgence of right. things is, is a little nuts well and I am I wrong I think I read that truffle oil a lot of it isn't actually oh, there's right. like no yeah. truffle in it no it's so, synthetic like flavor yeah. what 
Well, it's like well, it's like <laughs> butter. Butter at a cheating. movie theater is typically not rancid really oil. Butter. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, it's definitely not butter. A exactly. Lot of honey we buy isn't even really honey. I mean, there's like so many scary things if you start to. It's a rabbit really hole. Well, <laughs> I went to a. I will not say the name of this. In fact, I don't know if it really even exists anymore, but in my little town of Hillsboro, <laughs> where we don't have a lot of cuisine going on there, but but there was a restaurant we went to and everything on the menu was fake. I mean, everything. I think everything on the menu was fake. And then I finally I got to where I was getting these pancakes and I was like, can I just have honey for the pancake? Because they had imitation maple syrup. Right. And when they brought out imitation honey, I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. We I mean, can't, you a... can't just buy real honey for this place? Oh. I mean, that seems very bizarre to me. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it that might happen more than you, you realize. I think when you're having to buy from very big companies that are, you know, food just food suppliers, I won't name any, but, you know, you could imagine what they are. I mean, a lot of that stuff has to last forever, you know, right. so there are a lot of, and it's cheap, right. too, which is a big part of it, although honey is the one food that never goes bad. So I mean, yeah, let's just, let's get the real stuff in there. (laughs) I thought it was just amaze me. Okay. So here's the other thing I learned. Um, I did not realize that we have been tweaking with the genetics of fruits and vegetables forever and a day. I I thought that was like a new thing. I didn't realize that watermelons used to look this way a long, long time ago. And then we did this and now we got these beautiful red, la la la. And I didn't know peaches used to be this. So how do you feel about, I mean, just looking at some of the, I, that I was looking at, like there's this black galaxy tomato, which uses the pigment from blueberries to color it. Like, how do you guys feel about that? I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I think there's um, a really exciting thing happening right now in food. And I, I had, maybe you can say food science, that there's a big difference between genetically modified organisms or foods and then selective breeding, which okay. is what's been happening since the dawn of people okay. eating food gotcha. so forever you have been picking out the things that grow the best in your field save those seeds and grow them again because you want to have a successful crop whatever you're growing um, so farmers have been doing that for a really long time they've been cross-pollinating plants to pick out characteristics that they want to introduce into a new plant that's like a very natural way of doing things it's been happening forever and for a really good period of time in our American history I think people stopped doing that for flavor and they did it for um, transportation being things that could sit on a shelf for a really long time or right. ripen much later so that they didn't get bruised during you know shipment um, but now you've got really interesting plant breeders who are working with chefs to say okay how do we make the food taste good again yeah. um, oh, which I, I think is it. awesome um, but in contrast to that you also have food scientists who are saying how can we take organisms from fish and put it into a vegetable to make it last a really long time and make it you know not susceptible to pesticides yeah. so we have to put more, you know, more inputs into the into the soil, which kills the soil. I mean, like GMOs are complicated for many reasons. It's not just for what they do to us, which we don't really know. Right. It's a lot about what they're doing to the the soil um, and the health of the soil and honeybees and all this kind of stuff. So it's gotcha. it's complicated. But I think sometimes people get scared by this, like these new varieties of crops, which doesn't always mean it's a GMO. It, it often I'm glad means you a, said that because I was kind of excited about some of the stuff I was reading about. I thought, ooh, how fun. Yeah, but I mean, I can't speak I, to it all. Should but. I not be happy about that? You know, I mean, yeah, that's... We, we've we're got We're really some, fortunate. Yeah. yeah, we used to, you know, every couple of months go up to Cornell University in New York and and work on, you know, different breeding of, like, sweet potatoes and squash and cucumbers and all this. And, you know, yeah, trying to, like, really create things that were more flavorful and, you know, that also were, you know, that you could grow in, uh, on your farm and not have to worry about tomato blight or, you know, things right. like that, you know, affecting it. A really good full circle story is that years ago, this amazing breeder at Cornell, his name's Mike Mazurik, he had been working for years on creating a not spicy habanero pepper because he loves the flavor of a habanero. But obviously they're crazy yeah, hot and right. you can't eat much else after no. it or taste much else after it. So he finally was able to create this pepper that was a habanero that tasted like a habanero but wasn't spicy and we were part of the experimental trials at the farm stone barns where we worked at blue hill and we used to be kind of serving that to our guests and saying hey this is an experiment that's going on right now like this is really cool so six months ago we i think was it instagram i don't know if it was no, social no, I just media got, we were actually in new york and i got a text from earth uh, matt one of the farmers was, was yeah farmer at earth dance and He's like, I've got these habanada peppers, which is what they were, were oh. called. He ended up calling them. And we're like, you're kidding me. 
You're growing them? Like, so... We... Well, he asked me, yeah, because he was like, you know, have you ever heard of these? And I was like, yes. We're like, <laughs> uh, yeah, we're I'm very intimately now. involved with these peppers. Wow. And now it's something that anybody can grow, yeah, you know. And, and they're oh, delicious. Cool. And so we've been serving them on our tasting menu and being able to just say, like, I know you're going to think that we're going to trick you to, and it's going to be really hot. These things. <laughs> but it's not. So, like, to see that, like, cycle of things is really cool. So there's, oh, there's a cool. lot of stuff like that happening right now, and I think a lot more um, – plant breeders are, are understanding that people want things to taste good, not right. just to be long lasting and pest resistant things right. like that. So um, it's not all scary. I love it. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And I actually, can I ask you one bonus question? Sure. Do you guys have a favorite foodie movie? Foodie movie. Oh, Ratatouille. I was going to say, it's going to be Ratatouille. <laughs> um, I love it. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a pretty great one. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you guys so much. And You're welcome. Thank you. Congrats with all the fabulous things going on with the restaurant and your your website is it's uh, visiarestaurant.com okay and we've got our menus which we um we do change the menu a lot so we try to update that as frequently as possible online um you can make reservations online check out you know what's going on you know on our instagram feed and all that stuff well i'm so glad you guys are here thank you so much and for everybody out there, thank you for listening to Mishmash Podcast. Uh, please be sure to subscribe on iTunes if you have not done so already. Have great days. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah, that was yeah. great. That's so interesting. It was really fun, though. When I mean, you know, sometimes I'm doing research on who I was and I'm like, that was kind of boring. This is, like, oh my gosh. I like, I, the, I'm finding out so many interesting things. There was this whole site that was from Israel. That was all about all these different fruits and vegetables that they were coming out with. That, mm. they, that black galaxy tomato, for whatever reason, caught my eye. The idea of using the pigment of the blueberries. Yeah, I've heard really... that one. Yeah, I haven't either. There yeah, are so I mean, many tomatoes. Oh, my word. Like, you name it. Um, well, it's just amazing what's out there. And, yeah. I mean, how silly am I that I didn't realize, you know, like, this is what bananas used to look like. And I'm like, ew. <laughs> Who would eat that? You know, and they're like, and here's what we did. So make, and I'm like, wow, I did not realize bananas used to look like that. Yeah, people, people have been been smart for a long time in terms of you know knowing what you know what to select for. But I think there's just, again, like when you don't have that personal connection anymore to going to a farm to buy your food because right. we don't have to. We can go to the grocery store. Like yeah. there is no conversation, and it's like, well, this is what it looks like. That I, you know this is what I'm buying and, right. and that's it, you know? So I think it's exciting. I think more people are starting to pay more attention to stuff like that. And I think we have a, a long way to go, but I think that's part of the reason why people, when they come to eat at this year, they feel like, Oh wow. Like I had never thought about, you know, a turnip like this, you know, yeah. the taco shell or, right. you know, like that's what, that what do I do with turnips? So you know, it's like good. you boil them, you know, it's like, there's just not, uh, you know, so it's, it's been really neat to get people to sort of change their way of thought a little bit. Um, and, you know, it's a very small thing. Well, it, it's not going to change the world, but we're doing what we can to well, that's just move the conversation just, forward. Yeah, you got to just do your part. Yeah. If everybody yeah. did their part, it would be a lot better. <laughs> Some people think their part is something that they really shouldn't be doing. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Well, thank you, guys. Well, thank I you. I appreciate yeah, it. Great. I will email you when this is... Okay out there and we can uh and oh and i will take us off of here so that we can thank you guys thank you guys <laughs>